Cover, yeah. Yeah, yeah. cover, yeah. and then I did one of my own, and I was yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll let you guys continue. Right. <laughs> yeah. There you go. I got your black cherry. Oh, that's perfect. I'm going to go drop like a couple dollars in there. Thank you. 
Well, thank you so much to everyone for, for coming out to Bunker tonight. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, everyone um, coming out for some improvised music and, and poetry. Um, this is kind of our second time doing this. The last one was with um, Bob Sakara, which was wonderful back in, back in May. And um, Bob put me in touch with um, Megan and Ember here, um, who we had a short rehearsal um, a couple weeks back. And um, from what, what I heard, I really loved their poetry as well. So thank you again. Um, tonight we have Brooke Knoll on the harp, Jeff Harshbarger on bass, Rachel Ellis on uh, bassoon, and my name is Evan Verplew. Um, the performance will be about 60 minutes. Um, it'll be um, poems kind of interspersed throughout the, throughout the um, performance. So um, if you feel the need to like get up, walk around, go to the bathroom, turn it, that's totally cool. Just know that it'll be about, about 60 minutes and there will be a little break. So um, feel free to like, you know, go to the eye or do whatever. But um, yeah, again, thank you so much for being here and uh, we'll get started. <laughs> Oh, and that camera's live on the internet, so don't say anything incriminating. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Preciousness with you, your childlike valor, your wholeness. Hold these inside of each inhale. When there is breathlessness inside your bones and you cannot untangle your thoughts from the sides of your skull, let the hopeful wrap you in oil. Bring your wishful thinking your denim whispers. Hold them inside of your gut like gems, dug in the earth roots of the other side of your spine. Residing there, they gleam like fear in the eyes of your enemies. Your softness and your mercy. Bring your fleshy intuitions. Let them breathe. Let them seep furious or with a quiet heart into the hinges of your jaw so that when you see need of your voice you speak only with what knows of the richness within you do not feel that you cannot be soft fill the spaces between your fingers with dirt Feel your quietness take hold of the earth. Thank you. 
there are multiple and it may just change again, but I won't tell you the first one back from the first edition of the book, the given title. I did not get to choose that one and subsequently found that it doesn't really fit the direction the story's going anymore, but let's be honest. If you know me in any capacity, you've probably heard that first title called out by a well-intentioned barista because I forgot to give them the current working title of this story that still sometimes wears its history on its sleeve emblazoned on its book cover because the title of this story is Open Book. Or at least open to interpretation. Some readers may study the body of the text and question the writer's decision to diverge, argue that the first one fit better, yet they will simply come up with their own and sling them at this work in progress. Passers by, their words sting like needles and hurt like hot coals. Maybe the title of this story will only ever be hurting like hot coals. But I will make sure that it is heard only by a room full of strangers on a Wednesday night or a Saturday afternoon. If only the writer could make up their mind about where on the spectrum this novel lies. The title of this story is indecisive. As a crisis of gender and identity run like fault lines through the subtext, where is my bedrock, my stable ground, even when I feel sure that a frame will fit, this creeping itch begins to set in and leaves me to worry whether this story is even good enough for titles like artist or selfless or loved or lover. How do I know that I love you if the title of this story is imposter? There's a reason many poets wait till the work is complete to christen it, to bestow a post-op moniker to this post-mortem poem, to hammer it into a stone only as a final epitaph. Tell me, will I one day get to name my life? Or when the title of this story is simply death, will it then be the goal of readers to look back on its pages, to peer through different colored, different tinted lenses, judge the character and choose the identity for what they see fit. The title of this story has yet to be determined. I'm so tired of it all. I'm tired of questioning, I'm tired of the self-psychoanalysis. I just want to be something for this story to mean something to somebody like me after I'm gone. And so the title of this story, well, we'll see, won't we?
was over. This love was waiting for me to laugh, and I always, always did. Where does this love go? Does this love float up to the sun like a balloon lost from a child, making its way to inevitable destruction? Or does it sink like clay, the bottom of the sea, scatter like krill in the wake of the predator? Does this love sit under so many feet, hiding under subway chairs and only coming out when the train car is empty, small, and alone and unheard? Or is this love in Paris? Or in Madrid? Is it staying up until dawn and slipping away to a stranger's hotel room? Does this love know what it wants? When it rains, does this love fill your open mouth? Spill from around your teeth and down your wet chest? Or does it pool? Stagnant? like a puddle in the city street. Now, when I think of you, it is like I've been loving a stranger. Each time I roll the memory of you around my mouth like a flavor, you become more of a figment. But there is truth in it still. I will not feel bad for loving you. I will never apologize for the wide cavern of my capacity. In loving you, I am love. In loving you, I am reflecting the bud bright eclipse of morning rising behind the mountain of this city and feeling the way you made me feel. I am immortalized. I am sunk, a palm pressed laughing into the wet concrete of this human homescape. Shooting 
stars does not have to be a solo journey. The year there to give her the push she needs as she finds herself slowing. I mean, how could things have gone any other way? Thank you. 
bird perches in front of a neon window. As her wings stretch wide across plastic tiles, as rumpled feathers flutter in wind, as talons click and clatter against glass, slumbering no longer and barely awake, Songbird composes again, now in the small hours before dawn, with a sunrise that waits for song to begin. You like the bird pausing in her flight. Blackbird breaks the silence with a bold and bittersweet tune that beckons forth those first rays of light. Songbird listens eagerly this prelude. Thrush hums to a hushed whisper and the hardened heart can't help but to melt as warmed in the light of a morning sun and songbird stands in awe. A while on them to slide she feels it give way beneath her. Robin recites a requiem so resounding and woeful. Wren whistles wistfully as she tells a tale, a tells a tale of lost love. Finch's hasty hymn trills and chirps, and finally it is Songbird who flies up to center stage, who perches on a long, thin limb, breathes for a moment, and then she sings. rushes over her and fills her lungs with breath. Songbird belts her chorus as she crescendos to her final peak. Eyes closed, tight, wings spread wide as the last line leaves her beak. She sings, she sings, she sings, knowing she Oh. Uh -huh. 
tell you, this spirit still pours from the drain pipe. She still shimmies in and around the cold stones of full and wet rivulets of rainwater just waiting to soak your shoes. You should know, there are more answers than there are questions more forgiveness than there is hatred, more peace than the thousands of hard pits of anger you keep stored in your gut. In case you forget, I am not just some sorry soul, I am the fullness of a waiting storm. I am the lick of an electric caress. I am not gone, just somewhere else. My bed is in the corner and will be until I turn 30, at which point I may deem it too childish. But for now, I have just enough child left in me to crawl into my corner bed and 
call to my cats so that I may not sleep alone. Sometime between a full body stretch and a reach for the light, I also call on God. I mean, not like it rains. But you know what, let's say it does. Maybe it rings once or twice before God picks up, like God is out there somewhere with an opened bottle of nail polish pinched between two fingers and a half-painted hand gingerly gripping the very retro plastic landline she obviously has. Hi God, I say, just checking that you're making room for bigger and better things. Because, see, what you don't know is that this is a season of my life in which I feel robbed. Robbed by a man with a penchant for house music and a disgustingly strong hold over my nervous system. Robbed by my own big emotions, which are loud and unapologetic. So, this is a season of my life in which I feel entitled to compensation. However, this time it seems God has more important things to worry about, which to me seems very strange. God rolls her eyes, sets down the cobalt blue nail polish, leans forward in her vintage crushed red velvet fainting chair, and says, Shut the fuck up. This is the bigger and the better. Look around. You have magic coloring your every moment. You have guests running through the halls of your hearts. You ache and make music and sing every day. Your body, it moves like it's supposed to. Like water running over rocks and your blood rushes kindly to your heart. You pick clothes out of a hole in your wall, match colors to patterns, you loop silver around your fingers and cut holes in your ears to hang gems from. This is the bigger and the better, bright and more. Life is brave and so are you, and life can feel sometimes like a pool of water just wide and deep enough to make you panic, but just remember that your lungs were made to keep you alive. And if you take a deep breath and lay back, you'll feel almost just like your clothes.
take this. It's dangerous to go alone. It's time to fight God. Everything you need is inside you already. Sword that seals darkness.
You are ravenous, and I am getting smaller by the bite. You've kept me on a diet of poetry and condensed milk like veal. The most tender bites always come from cages, and you've crystallized me in sugar. So sweet, so plump, and yet so devastated. Yes, love, you are ravenous, but I am starving. I am seared on both sides, raw in the middle and starting to go rancid. I am wild, wild with need, because darling, the more I give you, the less I have, so that now all I want is to be exactly what you crave. Reduced me like a red wine, left me to simmer, to boil, to curdle and become blackened nothing, and I have never tasted a hunger like this before. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Um, we have uh, Megan McCullough, Lindquist, and Amber Deer as our poets tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again. Have a good rest of your night.